Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page, and please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Clark Murphy about sustainability as a leadership competence and turning sustainability pledges into everyday practices. Clark Murphy, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Great to be here. appreciate you having me here. Yeah, it's great to be with you. We are Red Frame Glass brothers. We were t- chatting in the pre-interview just how we both have uh, beautiful red frames to our glasses and how we always wanted that as children, and, and now we have it as adults. When you're an adult, you kind of get to choose and have more say in, in those types of things, so it's fantastic. You're joining us from New York. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah, and today we're not going to be talking about red frame glasses, but we are going to be talking about sustainability as a leadership competence and how we can get beyond just sustainability pledges in organizations, you know, the social desirability of sustainability pledges and kind of that social pressure for organizations to do that. I I suppose that's a good thing because that's moving the needle, but we need to get beyond pledges and we need to turn it into actual action and everyday practice within organizations and how we run. So that's what we're going to be talking about together today. As we get started, I wanted to share Clark's bio with everybody. Clark Murphy is the former CEO of Russell Reynolds Associates. He advises the world's top companies on leadership strategies that fuel profitable growth and value for all stakeholders. He is dedicated to helping CEOs and board members embrace sustainability agenda and use their position to solve the greatest social and economic challenges of our time. His work on sustainable leadership has been published by Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, and the World Economic. Murphy has spoken at the United Nations Global Compacts Leaders Summit and the World Economic Forum's Sustainable Development Impact Summit. His own journey to sustainability began with a near-death experience a boat he was on nearly collided with a discarded shipping container bobbing in the sea. And what a horrific experience. He co-hosts the Redefiners podcast, and he has a book coming out on this topic here in just another month and a half. It's a pleasure to have you, Clark. Anything else you would like to share with listeners uh, by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in further? No, this is great. By the way, could you come introduce me to a lot of people around New York City? That was, that was I'm flattered. I'm like, wow, where'd that come from? So, well, well researched, John, but no, no, I'm good to go. This is a, a topic, a passion of mine, as, as uh, you could hopefully tell. So want to dive right in? Yeah, excellent, excellent. Uh, and we'll just start off by teasing, and I'll, I'll let you share just a little bit about your forthcoming book that's set to come out in about six weeks yeah. um, on this topic, and then we'll just dive in. Absolutely. So it's it's uh, called Sustainable Leadership, Lessons of Courage, Grit, and Action by CEOs that wanted to build a better world. It's talking to CEOs I interviewed around the world from Singapore to Sydney to San Francisco, uh, Germany, et cetera, <clears throat> on, and who we regarded as successfully commercial sustainable leaders. And what were the mistakes they made, the lessons they learned from from Adidas launching a, a performance sneaker uh, made out of uh, recycled materials from the ocean, and the launch didn't quite work, but the sneaker was well done, to uh, Duke Energy looking at you know transforming the future uh, as they retire coal-based plants. And it's, it's a takeaways for CEOs or for those who want to be CEOs of, so how does this apply to you this week, this month, this year, or in your career? Um, and again, it's, it's, 
And it's talking about people from moonshotters, those who said, we're going to change the world. I'm going to commit. I don't know how I'm going to get there all the way. But if I don't commit, then what am I going to do? To 100 percenters, those that need every single fact to be certain before they do anything, which is largely why they never make it to the starting line. Uh, and finally, what I call fence sitters. The biggest issue you have in sustainability is the people who say nothing sit on the fence. And if it goes well, they go, I was with you the whole time. Or if, you, if it doesn't go well, they say, I told you so. And you need to identify them, yank them off the fence, say, are you on the team? And let's measure what you're going to do, or it's not going to work here. So the book is, is a practical look at getting stuff done in sustainability. Well, I love it. And, and again, aspirational goals, that's fantastic. And if someone who didn't really fully understand or wasn't on board previously now is able to at least open their mind and have some aspirational goals, that's better than not, right? But only having the goals or only having the PR statements and the sustainability pledges, that's just not enough in the modern world. It's certainly not going to make much of a difference uh, or any impact on the, the biggest challenges that we face. So like you said, getting people off the fence, getting people to actually buy in, to actually contribute and make you know meaningful changes in their day-to-day not just like year end goals, but like, what are you going to do today? What are you going to do yes, this week? What are exactly. you going to do this month? Uh, if we can do that, we can start moving the needle <clears throat> actually, <clears throat> excuse me, actually rather rapidly if we can do that. Um, mm -hmm. So I love the premise of the book. I, I love the approach that you're taking in the book. And we're just going to dive in and, and talk more about that um, for the rest of our conversation today. So let's talk specifically about sustainability as a core competency for leaders. Um, that's something I know you're, you're passionate about. You talk a lot in your upcoming uh, release of your book. What do you mean by that? Why is sustainability a core competency? A lot of times we talk about sustainability, you know, in terms of, you know, our environmental global sustainability efforts, and we have a sustainability plan. How is sustainability a core competency of, of effective leaders in the future of work? Yeah, we did some research with um, the UN, United Nations Global Compact. They created the Sustainable Development Goals 21, almost 22 years ago, Okay. And um, we went and interviewed and tested who we call the 55 pioneers, people who, this is in 19, uh, 2019 and, and early 20, and they had really made massive uh, visible action improvement. Were they different in any way from merely commercially successful leaders? Surprise, surprise, they were. And it comes to your question about competencies. We think there are four key skill sets, I'll call them, competencies or skill sets that differentiate and that you can interview and test against to help accelerate identifying and developing these leaders. The first is, is a mouthful. We call it multi-level systems thinking. What is that? It just means complexity. It's dealing with the environmental, social, cultural, and operating integration of your business. So can you envision the complexity of your operations being more sustainable, your supply chain being more sustainable. So it's a, it's a skill set. The second is stakeholder inclusion, not the kind of rah, rah, let's get everybody included. Are you willing to include your competitor or your regulator inside the tent and what you're going to do to really make progress forward? So what, what's an example? Uh, Mayor Shipping said, uh, we're going to create methanol clean uh, engine shipping because, because the, uh, bunker fuel used for ships is one of the ugliest fuels in the world. And they said, there's no value creation in the engine. It's about everything else we do. So let's get the whole industry to get behind green fuel. And Mayers led with a $2 billion commitment to building ships. Uh, let's include our competitors. It's okay. So the second is stakeholder inclusion. The third is disruptive innovation. And, and again, it's a phrase used all the time. What does it mean? It means you're able intellectually to challenge your own assumptions. You're a smart leader, you're successful, you're proven. But what if you're wrong? Can you handle it and act? And the fourth is long-term activation. Again, we all talk about long-term. When you fail, will you pivot and keep going? When everyone says you're wrong, will you say, no, we can create a green super tanker? So long-term is dealing with failure. So the four are complexity, stakeholder inclusion, disruptive innovation, long-term activation. Those are differentiating competencies that one can tell if they're going to be a, a good, and they're predictive 
of success for sustainable leaders. Yeah, I love it. I, I think all of those are super important. And again, if we want to drive change and have an impact in our leadership with and, and leveraging our organizations to make a difference in the world around these thorny social environmental issues and such, uh, then it takes those types of approaches. And I, I love the point about, you know, am I willing to be intellectually humble enough to admit when I'm wrong <laughs> and actually try to, to, to shift and adapt and, and be agile and move forward. Uh, it, it's, it's amazing. You know, I get it. I get it. If you're a senior executive, you've had tons of success in life and in your profession, in your career, you're probably very smart. You're very good with people. You're probably, you know, you have organizational skills. You have all of these skills. Otherwise you wouldn't have gotten to that point. Um, and it's super easy to drink the Kool-Aid because as you move up, you tend to get surrounded more and more by sycophants, people who want, yes, men and women who want to tell you what you want to hear so they can get ahead in their career. And pretty soon, if you're not careful, you're going to be in a bubble and you're just going to think that everything, every word out of your mouth is just brilliant. And then it's going to be almost impossible for you to like step back and have that intellectual humility. So I think that is a really, really important key not even just in relation to this sustainability uh, idea yes. that we were talking yeah. about, but just generally, like if Overall, we can't, if we can't foster that, we're going to be in big trouble in the long term. I, I think you nailed it. What I was amazed having interviewed from all these countries, not in Brazil, the CEO of BP, Heineken, all these companies, a, a, a reassuring amount of humility in almost all of them. Uh, and I think it's getting at this sustainable leader thing that, that, that Henry Timms wrote a book, um, about about power that the the days of the hierarchical CEO I have done this for thirty years I have all the answers is gone knowledge is compressed organizations are compressed the humble executive listens so much better than talks because they're able to pivot and we I have a, a, a thesis that I've talked about for a long time it's in the book as well called LQ or the learning quotient so as a kid were you smart IQ as a, a growing professional EQ, can you read people? Are you figuring it out? Now it's LQ. The humble, sustainable executive is learning all the time. That's why they're successful. Uh, and they're not afraid to be learning the same information at the same time as the 35-year-old. So they're learning together. And the LQ- as And an sometimes they're, and sometimes often they're learning from, right? Correct, 100%. <laughs> So I think a, a company's LQ, what's the, how high is the quotient for your company culture? If it's arrogant, it's probably not going to pivot fast enough. And the individual leaders. So the sense of humility and learning, I think, are really tied to sustainable success. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you've already identified what some of the best companies are doing, a couple examples of, of what they're get, getting right. Um, do you have any other thoughts on, on some of those types of examples or what some companies are really getting wrong uh, in relation to sustainability efforts? Yeah, so, so a couple of things. Uh, we were shocked, we did some research, we were shocked that um, a large uh, group of executives, 45% of C-suite leaders, we did a, a survey around this topic, 11,000 leaders in nine countries, said that they viewed sustainability as a branding exercise as opposed to an operating exercise. Uh, and 21%, it's about value creation. Okay, that's really alarming. If you're focusing on the brand aspect, this is where you started. Pledge, 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 not commitment. But you look at companies like Heineken, who's taken a really hard look at circularity in terms of, okay, the, the use of water in brewing, uh, the use uh, of, of delivery trucks, et cetera, They've made huge commitments and they did it through competition of employees and young leaders saying, give me your best sustainable idea. You're going to come, you're going to come to the headquarters, present the idea, and then we're going to do it. Okay. So they've instantly embedded a sustainable mindset and the commitment deep into the organization. Phenomenal. And, and to your point earlier, a learning mindset, right? Absolutely. And, yeah. and, and it's accelerated several people's careers from Monterrey, Mexico, their largest brewery outside Amsterdam, now working at headquarters. So I, I think embed deeply, find ways to do that. It's not top down. Um, I think Duke Energy, um, 
utility, coal-powered plants, dirty, uh, has made huge commitments. They have community engagement in Asheville and Raleigh-Durham where they said, what do you need? And it was like, we want cleaner buses. We want your cleaner trucks. We want money around education. We want a longer term approach to this. And you're in mountain towns and towns that are deeply driven in North Carolina about uh, sustainable living. And they're like, okay. And they started something called Blue Horizons. I won't go too far into it. That basically said, we'll go community first and get to the new cleaner plant, which they need to build instead of coal later. And, and then the community in the end was hugely around this. So I think it's just taking that longer term view uh, has been hugely successful. Um, I think the last one would be at, uh, picking talent is a startup steel maker. There's no dirtier business than steel, H2 Green Steel in Scandinavia. And they're constantly going off site to say, what's the role of this company? And this is about building the future of the world, steel, with clean produced steel. And they're constantly reminding everybody in the company about let's not lose sight of where we started from. Yeah, great examples. Uh, and it gets maybe to my next question. So clearly there's you know an environmental and social case for sustainability. We want to do better for to create a better world for us, for our children, for our grandchildren. Hopefully people get that vision they catch it they want to be a part of that um but again like we we talked about a few times now it's not just about the sustainability pledges it's not just about the pr or the branding uh component but we got to get beyond that and and there's actually a lot of research that shows that can drive uh typical uh metrics of business success for organizations uh but then another really important piece of this is the human capital piece uh because more and more especially younger employees, uh, uh, younger individuals in the workforce, uh, younger millennials and Gen Z, they just flat out don't want to work for organizations that aren't sustainable. And so if you want to attract and retain good people, the the new crop of talent that's coming out of universities and early career uh, individuals, man, you're going to really need to, to buy into this in a real way. And, and start making a difference. Otherwise, those people are going to go other places and you're just going to lose out in the war for talent. And then where are you going to be? You're going to be really in a hard place at that point. Hundred percent agree. The the uh, whether it's the great resignation or the war for talent, which we've been talking about for for fifteen years, is applies deeply to these new populations of uh, people want to work. So I think you've got to embed it deeply. You also have to create ability to pivot that uh, if someone, if we're going to change the processes in the supply chain, how are you reaching in and pulling people and say, you know, those, uh, uh, those old fashioned operations, but we want you to come help us be part of creating something new. I think that creates energy uh, and, and commitment and, and hope. So it's not only, Let's retain young people, but let's reinvigorate uh, where we're going through change processes to keep a good people who have been in the company for a while. But uh, this talent war is real. And the brand belief, if I will work for this company, do I believe in this company? It is enormously powerful right now and, and really surged, I think, in the last four or five years. Yeah, so the overall employee experience and employee branding packaging of the organization, it needs to have a meaningful sustainability component to it. Uh, otherwise, you know, uh, many will vote with their feet and go other places. I know one one stat that um, I saw in the in the notes, you know, in preparation for the show today, you had mentioned it. Seventy uh, percent of millennials prefer to work for companies with strong sustainability agendas. Uh, yes. That's a big number right? We, we can't ignore a number like that. Uh, and my suspicion is, I haven't been tracking this over time, but my suspicion is that number is going to go up <laughs> as, as we uh, you know, move forward. So five years, 10 years from now, that number may be 75 or 80%. Uh, and, and Gen Zers are also wanting the same thing. So just super, super important. And yeah, we're just going to shoot ourselves in the foot. Uh, if if we don't take these things seriously. So while I, I I would wish that leaders and organizations don't need to to have you know the the bottom line metrics or the employee 
uh, retention metrics in order to justify doing sustainability in a meaningful way, I would hope that they'd be committed to sustainability anyways. Um, but I, I get the reality of it. So even if they're not, uh, look at the business case for this. The business yeah. case is clear. You better do it or you're going to be in trouble. Yeah. I mean, one uh, CEO of a global consumer marketing business, and I mean, top 50, Fortune 50, said, and, and there was all the kind of PR and the messaging and we're doing the interview, et cetera. And, um, and he has a thick accent. And, and at the end, he said, clock. He said, let me make it real simple. He said, if we don't keep the young people, I'm out of business. What the hell else is there for motivation to be sustainable? And I was like, okay, I finally got the truth. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, his, his focus, he's doing all the stuff about power and all of the stuff about water and all about the supply chain. But he said, if this keeps the best people, I'm in. Yeah. And yeah. that's my strategy. I'm sticking to it. And you're like, okay, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> yep. Yep. Perfect. Which actually leads well to the next question, you know, it's not a, a dichotomy. It's not an either or. You're either profitable or you're sustainable. And that that CEO that you're just mentioning, he understood that. He got that. Um, so how how do you help leaders to better see that connection and to, to help drive profitability and sustainability simultaneously? Because because it it should be. It, it's not mutually exclusive. It should be uh, mutually reinforcing uh, in our efforts. Yeah, so this is a really, really timely question because in the last month, as the inflation numbers have come out, the economic numbers of inflation up, economic concern and, and economies going down, people are like, oh, okay, we can't afford ESG. You know, that was nice. It's all about when you have profits, you do nice things for the world. And I think that's BS. I was at a conference on Sunday night, Monday uh, in Calgary, Alberta, and it was uh, board members and CEOs of 72 oil and gas or, or energy companies who in fact have been sustainable for a long time. They may be dirty industries, but they've been going through change and now it's the energy transformation transition and their profits, they get it. Their profits are going to create a greener world. But I think that uh, markets are efficient and externalities are priced into stocks or company valuations. The externalities of sustainability are here forever. I completely disagree. Did some people's soapbox preaching tick off some people the last few years and it's going to become more reasonable? Yeah. But profitability gets enhanced in the long term with more sustainable supply chains appealing to more sustainable consumers to get invested in by more sustainable institutional investors. It is here to stay. So you need great leaders, you need great young people, and you need processes and communications that articulate great sustainability. Yeah, those negative externalities are real. I think more and more people are, are fully recognizing them. Uh, and, and to your point, if we can recognize them and, and reduce or eliminate them as much as possible, that actually is a, a win for everybody. Yes. Uh, not only for the world, for the environment, for, for our communities, but it's, it's a definite win for organizations because it reduces risk. It reduces uncertainty. It reduces, you know, it just, it, it, it uh, increases all the positives uh, of the organization and just bring, it, it helps you bring more value uh, yeah. to the market. CEOs and boards are not walking away from this because, the economy is a little tougher. In fact, it's, I think they're going to double down mm. because because what I call it's a barbell. Institutional investors at one end, employees at the other, and the pressure is coming from both sides. Yeah, good. Well, so this has been just a fascinating conversation. What would you say for anyone listening today? They, they want to get on board. They want to become a sustainable leader. They want to develop that competency. They want to develop that competency in their people. What are two or three things that we can start doing today to develop that competency and capability in ourselves and those around us? Yeah, I, I think, are you willing to challenge yourself and the company or leadership team, uh, which you're a part of today? So um, are you, can you take the moonshot or do you need to be a hundred percenter? You actually need to take the moonshot, number one. Number two, um, make sustainability everyone's job. Um, just like Heineken put it all the way through the whole organization, uh, Given a speech every quarter or a couple of lines in a speech isn't going to do it. How do you drive sustainability into everyone's job? Um, LQ, 
are you listening and learning? Dealing with ambiguity, which is a competency we test for all the time, has become more and more important, basically since the financial crisis, since the pandemic, and now the world we're in. So one way to deal with ambiguity instead of being afraid of what to do, you need to be excited about learning and listening to know how you pivot in markets, whether it's to what the competitors are doing, what your own employees are saying, your own peers are saying, listen, learn, and pivot. So I think the LQ is very important. And um, build from the bench. Go, go. This book is to drive the, the identification and development of tens of thousands of sustainable leaders, not hundreds. Who do you know that wants to work on some project that's more sustainable for your operations, which will make you more successful? Identify them. Identify them and engage them. And that will reinvigorate your employee population. Uh, They'll be more motivated. They'll produce better stuff. Absolutely. Wonderful. Clark, this has just been a great conversation. Uh, We could go on and on, but we're going to pause there for today. You're welcome back anytime to continue. Um, But before we wrap up for today, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, where they can find your book when it's released, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Yeah, so Sustainable Leadership at the Russell Reynolds Associates website, easy link to do, or Amazon, Sustainable Leadership, Clark Murphy. You know, what are you going to do? If you took the time to listen to this podcast, then you care about sustainability. So watch your action. Answer the question yourself. What are you going to do? And take the moonshot. Good luck. We need as many sustainable leaders in the world as we can have. Thanks again, John. Wonderful. Thank you, Clark. It's been a pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Clark can do for you and check out the book. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page. And please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.